let me preface my comments this evening by saying that uh, the same comments I make as I introduce a lot of my, my classes to my students. I view it as my responsibility to challenge uh, students and perhaps anyone I, I speak to in, in this kind of a capacity. So perhaps you're going to hear some things tonight that, that you might question. In fact, I hope you do because I, I hope we get into a rousing discussion after my presentation. I just hope we've uh, parked our, our knives and guns at the door. <laughs> this topic is near and dear to my heart for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is the fact that I, I'm the product of um, both uh, environmentally and genetically, I guess to be thinking along these lines. I'm a South Central Pennsylvania native. I uh, grew up in a family-oriented dairy farm in terrain that today looks like this. But I will tell you that in, in 1940 and 1950, it did not look like this. You know, before the early days of the Soil Conservation Service, a lot of this ground was tilled uh, horizontally with, with no regard to the contour of the land and oftentimes resulted in, in uh, quite a bit of soil erosion. When I say I come by this genetically, my, grand, my maternal grandfather was one of the first farmers in Pennsylvania to work with, at that time, the Soil Conservation Service to lay out the contour strips on his farm and uh, pretty much set us shining examples that, that other neighboring farms followed his lead. And as a result, they were able to continue to till these acres and greatly reduce soil uh, erosion. Now, obviously, this was before the, the advent of no-till, or otherwise it would have, been, would have been less of an issue. Let's start tonight's uh, discussion by giving credit where credit is really due. This, of course, is Dr. Norman Borlaug, and those of you that are uh, actively involved in, in agriculture recognize him as the father of the Green Revolution because he, he did some very innovative things in the, the late 40s, early 50s in, developing, in the developing world, specifically in Mexico, India, and Pakistan. He basically brought three technologies uh, to uh, those farm populations. Number one, irrigation, or at least the, the most advanced irrigation that was known at the time. Number two was nitrogen fertilization. But they found early on that if you apply water and nitrogen to the small grain species that were available at the time, those plants would lodge and hence not be applicable to mechanical harvest. So he was involved with perhaps one of the earliest applications of biotechnology wherein they developed a dwarf wheat variety that could actually remain upright with increased yields as a result of water and nitrogen fertilization. And obviously uh, those techniques were uh, reached the far reaches of the globe, and we've been enjoying uh, the, the benefits of his early applications for the last 70 plus years. He is actually credited with literally uh, preventing the starvation of, of hundreds of thousands of people in those developing nations. Over the last 70 years or so, I think we made one grandiose assumption that perhaps is not true today. Uh, during his early application of these techniques, it was assumed that we would have limitless resources. For example, in this case, irrigation water. But I think we, we realize today that that's no longer the case. Just talk to the, the poor folks in California today that are, are in the grips of an extended drought. I would suggest that the new range war may well be, who's going to have priority use of the water? Will it be the folks that live in the metropolitan areas? or will it be for continued and perhaps even advanced irrigation practices. This is an artist's rendition of what we would call a dead zone in the Gulf of New Mexico. It's an algae bloom. We now know that in some cases, uh, perhaps excess of applications of nitrogen found their, its way into our groundwater and can uh, end up in the uh, Missouri River, Ohio River, Miss Mississippi River, and its tributaries, and re results in a dead zone in, in the Gulf of New Mexico. And an algae bloom, it pretty much uh, sucks all the oxygen out of the water and really uh, depresses uh, the normal aquatic life forms. 
you know, no-till applications have been around for 50 plus years. But you don't have to get very far from Shadron to find examples of tilled soil with tremendous erosion as a result of uh, heavy rainfall. You might immediately think that this form of soil erosion, meaning wind erosion, was, was taken during the, the dirty 30s or during the Dust Bowl era in extreme southeastern Colorado or western Panhandle of Oklahoma or Texas. In fact, this picture was taken just a year ago outside Phoenix. Okay. Of course, the, the population boom is in the forefront of the minds of anybody involved with agriculture today. You've heard or read about the predictions. We're in our current 7 billion people on the face of this globe is likely or projected to increase to about 9 billion people by the year two, uh, 2050. And about 90% of that projected increase is supposed to come or probable come from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, China, and Asian countries. Okay, the other point to be made is, as these developing nations attain a higher standard of living, one of the first things they do is eat higher in the food chain. In other words, they make a shift from a plant-based diet to an animal-based diet. So the point is, not only will we likely increase the world population by 25 or 30 percent, we're probably going to increase our need for food by, at minimum, 60 percent and in some studies are actually production, or predicting a 100% increase in the demand for food worldwide. There are those that, that uh, have uh, maintained a very strong position that we already raise enough feed, or excuse me, food to feed the, uh, the starving people of the world. In fact, it's been uh, estimated that perhaps as much as 25, maybe 30% of the food that we produce in this country is actually wasted for a variety of reasons. All one needs to do is to go to the back door of some of our major retail outlets and see what's in the dumpster. Or perhaps go to the, the south side of the student union and see what, see what food is thrown away every day. So the point is uh, we, we waste a tremendous amount of food and wouldn't it be nice to think that we could figure out how to distri distribute that excess food to the, the starving folks of the world. Unfortunately, as you know, many of the starving folks of the world reside in countries with tremendous political unrest that stands directly in the path of, of adequate food distribution. And of course, we have all kinds of export uh, trade regulations and, and foreign regulations or numerous hoops that, that obviously have to be jumped through. There are many in the agricultural sector today that truly believe that the secret to feeding an additional 20 billion people over the next 35 year time period without further undue degradation of our resources lies only within further applications of perhaps yet to be determined biotechnology strategies. Okay? I guess the other way to look at that is we'll have even further intensification of what I'm loosely going to categorize as an industrial agriculture. Okay. Here's a somewhat blurry picture of a major cattle feed yard. This picture was taken at uh, one of the Five Rivers yards. This one happens to be in southeast Colorado with a one-time capacity of about 150,000 head. Now Five Rivers is this country's largest cattle feeder. Uh, they currently have a uh, one-time capacity of between 1.3 and 1.4 million head of fed cattle on feed at any one point in time in seven yards. Okay. Five Rivers is owned by a company called JBS, the same company that owns JBS Packing Company, which today is either the largest or number two position as a major cattle packer in this country. The other uh, point to be made is JBS is a South American entity. The point is our cattle feeding sector and cattle packing industry in this country is heavily supported by, and I would use, even use the term propped up by, foreign investment. Obviously when we concentrate these numbers of cattle in confined spaces, we're going to generate a tremendous amount of waste material. Though heavily regulated, 
and fortunately so. Sometimes uh, some of that waste material does find its way into our groundwater sources and uh, result in groundwater pollution. Fortunately, very infrequently. Now, industrial egg production. We're probably all aware that uh, mass production of eggs in this country happens with, with hens that are in what we call battery cages that unfortunately allow very, very little room for these hens to, to turn around. But the point is, uh, as a result of aggressive animal rights activities, many states have taken a uh, legislative stand against battery cages for, hen for egg production. In fact, they're probably being out, uh, uh, outlawed within the next few years. Same can be said, uh, well, this of course represents a large scale broiler operation. Or in other words, we meet birds that literally have hundreds of thousands of birds under a single roof. This represents uh, individual gestation crates for gestating sows. Okay? Uh, the point to make here is uh, these crates allow these, these sows to stand up and lay down, but they can't turn around. Okay? Now again, due to aggressive animal rights uh, uh, activities, Numerous states have taken a past legislation wherein uh, individual gestation crates will likely be banned within the next few years, wherein we'll, we'll move more to group housing. Uh, on the finishing side of pork production, it's, it's likely that we'll continue to finish a uh, majority of our, our swine under close confinement conditions. Okay, uh, the dairy industry is not immune. You know, the small dairy herd that I grew up with was uh, somewhat of a pasture-based uh, operation, but today uh, in large com confinement dairy operations nationwide, a lot of these are located throughout the Western High Plains and Intermountain regions, all of the feed that's delivered, uh, that these cattle consume is grown, harvested, stored, and delivered to these cows uh, via fence line feed bunks mechanically. Point is, these cows never see green grass. Is it no small wonder then that on average, the average dairy cow in a large confinement dairy operation today has at most three lactations, a relatively short lifespan. Okay, this discussion would be incomplete without discussion of uh, the ethanol industry. Uh, we all know that this came about as a result of our federal government uh, residual fuel standards. Um, in fact, this graph depicts uh, the increase in ethanol production in this country over about the last, what is that, 32 year or time period. If we extended the graph to 2014, we're now producing about 8 billion gallons of ethanol annually. The other point is it consumes nearly half of the corn grown in this country for ethanol production. Now, what are some of the unintended, unintended consequences? Here about three years ago, as a result of the increased demand for corn driven by the ethanol industry, corn attained for a very brief period of time a value of almost eight bucks a bushel. Okay. That created an incentive for our landowners to take grass acres out of, out of grass and put it back into row crop production. As depicted by this five state area representing the western corn belt and the, the eastern high plains. I guess to put some numbers on that, over the seven year time period of 2006 to 2013, Nebraska alone lost, it's estimated 864,000 acres of grassland to grow more corn, okay? If you look at the five state area, it's about 1.3 million acres. Now a lot of these acres were, or had been enrolled in the CRP program or the Conservation Reserve program wherein the federal government actually pays farmers to take land out of production. Some of that land was actually in grass for 10 years, some of it 20 or longer. The point is the whole time it was in grass it at least had an opportunity to uh, maintain uh, soil reserves. Okay, the other point is that obviously the major crops in this country are grown as monocultures meaning that's the only crop that grows in that, on that land at that given point in time, be it corn or soybeans. In fact, you're probably all aware that the typical rotation in the, uh, in the corn belt is, is uh, corn followed by beans. Of course, the beans are a legume wherein they can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere 
and provide nitrogen in the soil for the subsequent year's corn crop. So that they, they really uh, a mutually beneficial arrangement. Uh, but again, grown as a monoculture. As we move further west into areas that don't get enough natural rainfall to produce a corn crop or a soybean crop, now we, we see more dryland wheat acres. But again, grown as a monoculture. I'm going to let you decide and make your own decision about whether or not we're really experiencing global warming. Though there is uh, some polar ice cap disappearance that would be highly suggestive, but perhaps the most glaring uh, figure is this graph right here. This graph depicts the increase in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere over the last 10,000 period, uh, year period of time. Now you would ask, well, how would we know that? As I understand, that's determined through uh, uh, ice bores that are collected in, in the Arctic and, and Antarctic regions. But if you focus your attention on the right-hand side of this graph here, the red line, that really depicts the rapid acceleration in accumulation of carbon dioxide over the last 150, 200 year time period. In fact, we went from about 280 parts per million 200 years ago, and 2013 was the first year that we eclipsed 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, okay? On this, on this course, it's projected that by the end of the century, we could be well over 600 parts per million carbon dioxide. Now the question becomes, where did the carbon come from? And probably the first thing that comes to our mind is fossil fuels, right? Fossil fuels, the internal combustion engine that uh, has dictated how we travel today. But what's the other tremendous source of where that carbon came from? It came from our soils. It came from our soils, okay? In fact, if we were to uh, walk out in the middle of our native rangeland that we're blessed with here in the Panhandle of Nebraska and take a soil sample, on average, we would find the organic matter in those soils to be five, six, perhaps seven percent, with tremendous variation depending on ecological site, okay? But it can be as high as seven percent. Most of our modern day row crop acres that have been tilled through the years, the organic matter is now less than 1%. The take home message is that organic matter is about 58% carbon. So as we've farmed these acres, or in other words, tilled these acres, we've released uh, that, that carbon into the atmosphere. Point is range. In my opinion, Nebraska's most valuable resource represents probably our best avenue to sequester or capture carbon, as, as I've indicated by this slide. Carbon sequestration or an attempt to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And why is this so or how can this be? It's because of tremendous diversity. I made the, the, the comments about the fact that most of our row crops today are, uh, are grown as monocultures, corn, beans, wheat, okay? Certainly not the case with uh, highly diversified uh, native range. In fact, depending again on ecological site, if we were to take the time to truly uh, determine composition of some of these sites, we could find as many as 70, 80 different plant species, grasses, forbs, out on this highly diversified native range. Tremendous diversity. So the question becomes, how can we mimic the diversity in native range and apply that to our row crop acres to try to reju rejuvenate the soil by capturing carbon. And the answer lies, at least part of the answer lies, with some of the techniques that a farmer by the name of Gabe Brown and his son Paul have perfected over the last 20 years. Gabe and Paul Brown are ranchers on native grass and also row crop producers on the east side of Bismarck, North Dakota, okay? In fact, uh, some of their property actually borders the, uh, the city limits of Bismarck. And of course, they'd have all the, the related challenges that would come with trying to farm and ranch under the guise of suburbia USA. But uh, about 20 years ago, uh, Gabe started doing some things out of necessity to try to change the health of his soils. 
he grows what he calls biological primers. They're really just cover crops, okay? And cover crops is not a tremendously new concept. I mean, for example, a lot of farmers have grown rye after corn, planting it after the fall corn harvest uh, in an attempt to uh, reduce uh, soil erosion during the winter months. But he, he plants uh, diversity of cover crops, a diverse cover crop mix that enhances the life and function of the soil. In fact, when he plants these cover crops, there could be 20 different species of, of uh, both cool and warm season grasses and broad leaves growing on the same ground at the same time. Four different categories, cool season grasses, warm season grasses, cool season broad leaves, and warm season broad leaves, all planted and grown at the same time. The point is tremendous plant diversity in an attempt to regenerate the soil. You know, today in agriculture, we, we provide a lot of discussion about the sustainability of agriculture. But in Gabe's way of thinking, he doesn't want to sustain a degraded resource. And his, he thinks we need to rejuvenate it first before we can ever sustain it. Okay, not only the diversity of uh, cover crop species, but also tremendous uh, diversity of animals that they grow on their farm. It's not just a cow-calf operation. It's not just a yearling operation, okay? Tremendous diversity of animals uh, that reside at, at Brown Ranch. And as a result, they, they attract a tremendous diversity of uh, wildlife. Mm -hmm. Not only above soil, but also below. Tremendous diversity of uh, nematodes and earthworms and, and microscopic organisms. Uh, in fact, it's been said that a tablespoon of, of uh, healthy soil uh, off of Gabe Brown's uh, highly diversified uh, cover crop mixtures, the soil beneath would, would contain more micro uh, flora than uh, there are people on the face of the earth. Okay, let's talk a little about their uh, multi-species grazing as they attempt to imitate what we naturally have occurring in, in nature. In this slide, you'll see cattle grazing in the background, grazing a cover crop. That's what he does with the cover, crop, cover crops. He grazes them. With, uh, he's got a cow herd and then he also grazes the yearlings. Okay, but those cattle are confined to a relatively short paddock, if you will, uh, maybe for a day. Sometimes he moves these cattle as many as four times a day. Okay? The point is he expects these cattle not to eat at all, only to eat about a third of it and trample the, wet, the rest of it. Okay? Now we've got these land heads in the, in the foreground here. About three days after those cattle leave that paddock, this eggmobile, if you will, gets moved to the, the, the paddock where the cows were three days ago. And if you think about it, three days is about the right timing for the fly larva to be hatching in those cow pies. So yes, the chickens function as scavengers to, to, to get their protein source from the cow pies. Okay? Now the chickens are also provided a grain source. Gra or range egg on the right, confined grain egg on the left. Which one do you think obviously is going to provide greater nutritional value for human consumption? Okay, they also pro uh, raise uh, broiler birds for, for meat consumption in bottomless cages out on grass. Uh, if I remember correctly, these cages are about 20 feet long and five feet, five feet wide. Every morning, he'll drag the, these cages to fresh 20 feet forward to fresh grass. And these birds get most of the nutrition through the grass and the soil underneath the grass. Now, yes, they're also fed a grain source, but, uh, but again, uh, harvesting the nutrients directly from the soil. Okay, they have sheep though not the, the typical kind of sheep that most of us have been exposed to through the years, not sheep that have wool. You know, through the years, oftentimes, uh, what it would cost us to pay a professional to shear the sheep costs more than the value of the wool. So there, there, are, there are actually what we call hair sheep that don't have wool. Yes, they'll grow hair, which you can see it shedding here during the, the, the spring months. But the other point about these sheep, they're highly prolific. 
uh, noted for multiple births, but also extremely easy care sheep. Pretty much a hands-off uh, system, uh, lambing out on grass. They also raise pigs. Okay, now out on grass. Now normally we think about pigs as only consuming grain. And in confinement operations, that's how they're raised. But a, a pig is just like us, an omnivore, wherein they can eat both grain and vegetative material. So they do raise and finish pigs on, on, in grass conditions. But they're, they're using some of the old heritage breeds like Berkshires and also a breed that's called Mulefoot. Okay, the point is they're stacking enterprises. They're stacking enterprises and I guess in my mind this is at least one model that truly represents uh, the new paradigm, if you will, for the next generations of farmers, ranchers, and agrarians to actually make a living on the land. Okay. A uh, number of the students in my classes are from commercial cow-calf operations. A number of, of them will likely have an opportunity and have the desire and hopefully will go home and take over those operations. But oftentimes I encourage them to think beyond just single species production. I think that the true economic opportunities are going to require that we think beyond just beef cattle. Talk a little bit about uh, the genetics that they use. Uh, those of you that are in the room uh, to remember the, the short squatty cattle of the 50s, Doc. Okay, this might look a little bit like them. Okay, point is that the grass type genetics that they utilize are not like most modern day beef cattle genetics. They're shorter in stature, they're earlier maturity, and they're more apt to maintain their body condition and actually grass fattened to produce their grass uh, finished product. And they're females, uh, again, smaller in size than most beef cows today, that excel in what we call maternal function. In other words, cow that cattle, females that excel in flesh and ability, feet and legs, udder quality, disposition, basically things that make a cow a hands-off problem, or they have no problems. They calve on their own and pretty much do it all on their own. They exert what we call reproductive pressure on these cows. They only expose these cows for about 35 days. And yes, uh, they do call the, the ones that are open or not with calf in the fall. So reproductive pressure. The other thing they do is they calve in sync with mother nature. Unlike most commercial cow calf producers that are more apt to calve in may, maybe a late February, March, early April time frame, these guys don't even think about calve until mid-May and they're wrapped up by the end of June. Okay, they calve on green grass and that's really why it's a hands-off process. Can sh uh, sure reduce the complication. Certainly perhaps the most healthy environment that we can have for a calving cow. And this is a picture of Paul actually enjoy the joys of calving in sync with Mother Nature. Okay, uh, let me take you through the life cycle of grass-finished cattle. Um, well, first of all, why grass finishing? Okay. Now, I'm not standing up here touting the benefits of grass uh, finished product to the demise of a grain finished product. I would guess that certainly within my lifetime, uh, grass finished product is going to be at most a niche market. In fact, the latest uh, numbers I was exposed to would indicate that today it represents about 3% of the uh, A maturity or the young cattle harvested in this country are grass finished. Okay. We're still going to have a, a tremendous grain finished uh, beef uh, program in this country for years to come. Takes longer with a grass finished product. Most grain finished cattle today are harvested, oh, let's say 13 to 16 months of age. On a grass finishing program, they're more like 22 to 26 months of age. So in essentially, essentially we add a year to the process. Now, the, and you can see the schematic here, they calve for about 45 days in May and June. The other really uh, big point here is that they nurse their mothers for an extended period of time. Yes, these calves are still on their mothers through the winter months. Okay, they're still on their mothers through the winter months. They then what we call fence line wean, which is a low stress weaning uh, method. And then they grade native range for five months. And then they go on to these multi-species cover crops 
in the fall months of the year for about 90 days. Then they go into what we call bale grazing, and I'll talk about that. But then they'll actually finish these cattle their third year, okay, on these cover crop mixes again, okay. So a grass finished product takes about a year longer than most grain finishing. This is a picture of the pears during the winter months, obviously, grazing the, the diversified cover crop that was planted after wheat in July, okay. Doesn't look like much, does it? Looks like perhaps no better quality than wheat straw. But in reality, it, it contains hairy vetch, which is about 18% crude protein, even at this time of the year, and about 70% TDN, or total digestible nutrients, as a measure of energy. Tremendous uh, winter feed for cow-calf pears. Also some sunflowers in there that you can see. But the point is they allow their cattle to graze even under these kinds of conditions. They make the cows uh, plow through the snow for their, for their intake. Now, those of you that are involved with cow-calf production are thinking, well, shoot, that can't happen here. We got too much winter. Well, look at the, uh, the days below zero in, in, in other parts of the world com compared to North Dakota. They make it work even with uh, extreme winter weather conditions in North Dakota. Okay, bale grazing, which I made mention to. They don't make their own hay. They don't want to incur the expense of equipment uh, purchase, okay? They buy baled hay, and their thought process is they want to import nutrients off somebody else's operation. They want to add to their, their uh, re regeneration of soil health. Okay, they lay these bales out where the cows are going to consume them during the winter months. And then they ration them off, you will, if you will, with a single strand of electric fence. But they don't, they don't put bale rings around these. They just let those cows consume that hay. Yes, there's waste, probably quite a bit of a waste, but they lay these bales out on an area that really needs to build organic matter. Okay? So that's how they add organic matter to some areas of the ranch that really need some help. I was there in August of 2012. It's a relatively wet year. I was standing in, in a field of standing corn. Now it's August, fully eared, tasseled, okay? And uh, look at the soil. That's not, that's not a result of a rainstorm. That's not wet. That's the organic matter in that soil. But it took 20 years to get there. Did not happen overnight. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit before about when grazing these cover crops, he confines the cattle to a relatively short area for a short period of time, wherein they're only expected to eat about a third, and then they trample the other two-thirds. And that, that two-thirds represents the armor on the soil, okay? And then there's so much soil life there that actually consumes that uh, residue on top of the soil. Okay, this is actually a native range picture that had been mob grazed. This electric fence wire reel was just laid in there uh, to give you some notion of size of, of this, er, or this uh, eroded gully. So the cattle have already been there. They mob grazed it. Well, if you notice the date, it was August the 1st. This is a month later. This is a month later, and we're always starting to see significant plant regrowth. Now turn the clock ahead about another 10 months. That's what it looked like the following July. The point is that mob grazing cattle, hoof action, if you will, is a tremendous erosion healing tool. Okay, okay a few uh, additional comments about soil carbon. It's, it's a driver for nutritional status of plants and therefore also nutritional status of the animals that eat the plants, but also nutritional status of the animals that we eat. So if you think about it, healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, contributes to our health also. Uh, soil carbon found in organic matter is the key driver for soil. One thing we haven't talked about yet is moisture holding capacity. Organic matter in the soil has tremendous moisture holding capacity. And oftentimes if we don't have enough organic matter, uh, that's the limiting factor to uh, getting maximum crop production because we can't hold our water. 
Okay, he's estimated that uh, due to his increased organic matter, he now can hold an additional 6,600 gallons of water on his row crop acres per acre. Okay, the point is, it's not how much water we, get, we get. It is not how much water we get. It's how much water we keep. And that's a, largely a function of organic matter in the soil. Okay, here's just a schematic that shows uh, the, prog the progress that he's made in soil depth and also the organic matter starting in about 1993 up through about 2010. So in other words, what, over that 17 time period, year time period, he went from 1.7% organic matter to over six. This is on row crop acres. And every step along the way, he added something. You know, he, he moved from conventional tillage to no-till. Then he started adding monocultures of cover crops. Then he started adding a diversity mix of cover crops. And then he added livestock in a mob grazing situation. This next, uh, I think these were soil samples taken just last year. He actually had some row crop acres that were now measuring 11% organic matter. Now, 20 year process. Today, Gabe Brown doesn't use any commercial fertilization. He has virtually eliminated all herbicide use. Think of what that can contribute to a row crop farmer's bottom line, that alone. But you're probably thinking, well, shoot, he's mined his soil. His yields are probably disastrous. In, in reality, his yields are 30% above county averages. So, increased yield drastic reduction in input costs. Now that's a paradigm to keep the next generation on the land, I think. It's all about soil health. Okay, there's a few of you in here that have, have seen this a few times and have been quizzed and tested over it <laughs> numerous times, but these are the five ba basic tenets of uh, rejuvenating uh, uh, soil health. Number one, the soil is covered at, at all times no bare soil ever, okay? Always have a growing root. As an example, in late July, August, when he harvests his wheat, sometimes that very same day he's in there no-tilling the cover crop to get that growing root in the ground ASAP. Use a diversity of plant species. We talked about combination of both warm and cool season grasses and broad leaves. Never till the soil. Now, yeah, we're gonna we're going to till a, a narrow band for no-till purposes, but we're not going to actually till the soil in the sense that we normally do. And then mob graze with uh, ruminants and not only cattle. Okay, another, another thought process here. It's a paradigm shift for row crop producers. Is this your customer? I mean, it has been for years. You know, sell the grain to local co-op, for example. Has been for years. Okay, I'm going to throw this, this next question out here. Or could this be your customer? In other words, get away from just growing monocultures of row crops and diverse, uh, growing a diversity of animals, of perhaps vegetables that could be sold directly to the consuming public. Now, yes, that next generation of farmers, ranchers that live close to metropolitan areas that have a population with disposable income that buy into the perceptions of a more healthful product are at an advantage. But I would contend that even uh, young farmers and ranchers that live remotely will figure out a way to be involved with direct consumer sales. Okay, so it's all about healthy soil, uh, resulting in clean water, clean air, but the take home message is healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, and enhanced human health. Gabe Brown, well, let me back up. Last fall, uh, we drug Gabe Brown through eight locations in Nebraska as part of the Nebraska Grazing Lands Coalition Traveling Roadshow. He was invariably asked by farmers in attendance, what's the right species that I should plant on my row crop acres? This was his answer. This is the right species to make sure we continue to plant on the land, okay? We've got to figure out how to keep people on land and keep the, and provide opportunities for that next generation. I'll leave, uh, leave you with two uh, quotes.
quotes here. This is an uh, Indian proverb, and it reads, Only when the last trees died, and the last river has been poisoned, and the last fish been caught, will we realize we can't eat money. And I'll leave you with this one. We really don't inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children, you know, for a very, very brief period of time, and it, it, it would behoove us to take care of it. So with that, uh, hopefully I've generated some thought process and hopefully some discussion and maybe even debate. Sure. And building the organic, mm-hmm. um, you know, organics in the soil, um, using um, newspaper, mm-hmm. you know, lay it down, no dig, um, wood chips, yep. and, and it was all about building the organics, retaining the moisture, and all that. So I was really, you know, how do you do that on a bigger scale? Well. Gabe and his son farm about 3,000 acres of row crop production. Now, not all those acres are involved with what he calls soil primers or cover crops every year. Okay, uh, you know he works them into his rotations between his row crops. Okay, uh, l- last time I asked, he had about oh, four or 500 acres under cover crops in any one season. But at some point in time over the last 20 years, all those acres were under cover crops probably numerous times. Mm-hmm. So it can be done on a, on a larger scale. Yeah. Are, there, are there other farmers across the nation who are doing broadly speaking the same sort of thing, or is he unique? He's, he's not unique. Uh, but by the same token, I'm not saying that this, these are widespread applications. I'd say we're years from this potentially being widespread. But there is, uh, there's numerous farmers that are uh, slowly making changes. Uh, I have had the opportunity to uh, attend what's known as the No-Till on the Plains Conference the last couple of years. It's held in Salina, Kansas. And that, that conference has been going on for 20 some years. And uh, the last three years, the prevailing message at that conference was soil health. In fact, they're seriously considering renaming that conference to the Soil Health Conference. So, uh, long answer to your question, in my opinion, not fast enough. Okay. In over the past 40 years or so, uh, it seems like the farmers just, farms just kept getting bigger and mm-hmm. bigger. And mm-hmm. now, drive in the rural areas, you may drive a couple miles before you even see a, a, a farmhouse. And I wonder if this intensity um, could bring back more people to the land. Great, great comment. Uh, in fact, um, Gabe and his son, Paul, rent some acres. Well, well, let me back up. I think as a general statement with industrialized agriculture, the, the, the message through the years has been get bigger or get out. Because you, you just need more units to, to spread your costs across to be able to make ends meet. Okay? Uh, Gabe and his son do rent some ground, but he said they have every intent to someday stepping away from that rental property mm-hmm. because they, they're now generating enough income on just the ground that they own. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How big is their spread, Ron? Well, as I said earlier, I think they've got about three thousand acres of row crops, and they rent that also, some of that, and then of course they'd have native range acres. Okay. How yes, sir. The uh, herbicide and pesticide people reacted to. <laughs> as, as you can imagine, not, not, not real thrilled. But I wonder if that might force them to come up with alternative applications of less toxic uh, products, or is that... Well, you would hope so, but 
uh, I think there's evidence today that some of our what we call Roundup Ready crops, um, there are now weed species that are now Im uh, immune to Roundup. So we find some of our farmers having to go back and use herbicide mixes again uh, to, to control some of these immune weeds. Are any of these acres irrigated? It's all dry land. They don't need to be because they, they retain the moisture. Well, now I understand, you know, Bismarck's further east than here, so they'd, they'd have on average a little bit higher rainfall. And the other unique advantage they would have is those are glaciated soils. You know, they've been, other, they've been under the, the, uh, the ice for a long time ago. Okay. So in terms of a range application, you talked about mob grazing and beating down a lot of that grass. Where's the balance between incorporating that beaten down grass, improving your soil health and the health of your grasses? I'm glad you raised that question. He uses the mob grazing on his uh, row crop acres, oh, on the cover crops, yeah. okay. Now he rotationally grazes his native range. Personally, I'm not sure that we have a fit for mob grazing on native grasses, okay. I think uh, there's been a lot of work done with mob grazing across Nebraska, but most of it's been done uh, in the eastern third or maybe get into the eastern sand hills on some of the wet meadows. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it has a huge application on native range. Of course, anytime we're, we're mob grazing or confining cattle to relatively small areas for short periods of time, the first limitation is water. You know, how are they gonna get water? Huge limitation, okay. Other comments or questions? Kurt. Going way back to the beginning of your presentation, can the world actually feed and sustain nine to 12 billion people even in years of really good agricultural practices? Without further degradation of resources? I'll add that to your question. Okay. <laughs> well, I've, I've asked myself that also on occasion, Kurt. And uh, I was watching the evening news tonight before I came over here, and, and we all know what's going on in East Africa right now with the Ebola outbreak. And it was estimated by the medical community that if we don't get on top of that real soon, there could be 1.4 million people infected by January. So my point is, perhaps the answer to your question is no. And perhaps there will be things that rear their ugly head to uh, restrain, you know, rapid population growth. I, I don't know. But I guess the central take home message here is that I personally don't believe that biotechnology alone and applications of biotechnology have not yet been discovered, and further intensification of industrial agriculture is, is gonna get the job done, because I don't think we can do that without further degradation of our resources. Okay. Teresa. Since the day you were hired, I knew you were a damn hippie. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, you didn't use the term liberal. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really interesting from perspective of concepts that are coming forward, like the local war movement, which you kind of illustrated in the, the check wagon sort of venue of selling pro mm -hmm. products locally, and also those which are referred to happy meat, mm -hmm. so um, removing animals from confined livestock. But I, I question whether that movement can really meet the demand of, of, the, of the consumer. Can we really produce enough beef and poultry and swine in these circumstances to meet demand? Well, I'm not suggesting that we'll take all of industrial agriculture and convert it to this paradigm. Okay. In fact, uh, the 26 billion pounds of beef that this country produces on average annually, if, if we made the incorrect assumption that it actually could be done strictly through a grass finishing program, there wouldn't be enough acres in America, okay? There would not be enough acres 
to produce 26 billion pounds of, of beef strictly through a grass finishing program. So yes, uh, my interest in this is not only re soil health and regeneration of soil is, it's an opportunity for the next generation of farmers and ranchers. Okay. Industrialized ag is not going to go away. Yes, ma'am. Continuing as we were with this rapid change of, of uh, increased farm land and uh, the fertilization and so forth, I think our soil would wear out to the point where we have even less likelihood of feeding the billions in the future. Well, that's why we, we now have to add all these fertilizers, okay, right. to, to, make, to keep the soil productive. Our soil will be so worn out that I think it will be less likely to sustain the population. I'm going to defer to a, a soil scientist. Okay. Okay. As a mere a European, when it comes to the United States, it does seem to me that. Uh, if you order a steak here, it's twice the size of a steak you get in Europe. Mm -hmm. Are Americans addicted to a meat diet? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I, I don't speak with any knowledge of these things, but it seems to me that meat is much more significant in the restaurant, the menus, and hamburgers, and everything. Uh, the uh, presence of green vegetables is a little shorter. Sure. Sure. And, you Is that a reasonable observation? Oh, I, I, th I think it's very reasonable, though I've never traveled extensively in foreign countries. But that is my perception also. But, and, you, know, you know, the point we made earlier here tonight as these developing nations, you know, increase their standard of living, one of the first things they do is move away from a plant-based diet to an animal protein source. Okay. So our diets in America can be or, or oftentimes the envy of the world. Okay? Now we could argue whether or not it's been right, wrong, or indifferent nutritionally. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think it would be better for people with their health and the environment and everything else to not eat so much meat, have more uh, grains and fruit and okay. vegetables. Well, you won't get any argument from me. Okay. okay. <laughs> Dairy farm, but you were talking about the um, planting to the contour mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. Is that for water retention, soil retention? How does that help? Okay. Well, it's to reduce soil erosion. Okay, I mean, if you think about it, instead of plowing or disturbing the soil perfectly horizontally, if you go with the contour of the land, it will slow down water movement. Okay. Now, the need for that is somewhat diminished today because farmers have adapted no-till practices. Okay. Though there still is some benefit to, to growing crops on, on the contour. Okay. But it's, it's all about soil preservation. I hadn't really seen it before, but I just drove back across Iowa and, and Nebraska and it was either on the, right in the border area, either Iowa or Nebraska, it caught my eye that there was a field that had been um, planted that mm -hmm. way. In fact, it looked like steps. Well, in, in some cases, particularly in the part of the world you're talking about, uh, there'd be terraces, mm -hmm. uh, which are put in to, again, retain water and s slow down the movement of water. And they're obviously put on, or they're put in by well, it used to be Soil Conservation Service, now it's the NRCS, or Natural Resource Conservation Service. But they're put in on the contour. They follow the contour of the, the slope. Okay. Other thoughts or questions? Well, I appreciate it. Thank, thank, you, thank you much. <laughs> Sorry you guys had to stand.